Thanks for joining us for today's video. Uh, today we're going to be talking about one of the most interesting and provocative questions um, in the short-term direction of AI, which is, do you really need open AI models for RAG, for retrieval augmented generation? Now, oftentimes the way that this debate gets framed is that open AI is the sleek sports car, and oftentimes that open source are a lot of hobbyists trying very passionately, um, but really um, looking at things through a lens that, that is not state of the art. And I think the view that we want to update, and I think the point of view that we want to really advocate through the course of this video, is to really think about open source not as a rickshaw, not as something from the past, but to really think about open source as really a different type of solution. Um, and what we really believe is that open source is the SUV. Uh, when you want to take your kids to uh, a sports practice, uh, you want to pick them up after school, you want to go run an errand at a supermarket, you want to go uh, out for a night on the town um, to go to dinner, you want to take a road trip, the SUV is uh, the family means of conveyance. And we would argue that while there are different benefits uh, to a Ferrari sports car versus an SUV, the SUV is the way. Um, it is the workhorse, it is what you live in every single day, and we believe that's really a, an apt metaphor for open source and the way that open source is going to be used in RAG automation. Now the reason for this, and really the case for smaller specialized models, which are primarily um, in open source today, um, is that they bring some very, very significant benefits. The first is that smaller models, models in the range of 1 billion to 7 billion parameters, typically from an inference and life cycle management point of view, can be run at least one order of magnitude, sometimes two orders of magnitude, and they're probably even a, a, an argument that they can be run three times, um, three orders of magnitude cheaper than large proprietary models that are 100 billion and up parameters. Not just from an inference point of view, but from a training point of view as well. They're much, much cheaper. And the point we would want to emphasize here is not just cheap, but faster. Faster to fine tune, much, much easier and practical to start adapting to a specific domain, a specific workflow, or a specific business process. And that really leads us to how people use RAG. We believe that most use cases of RAG in the enterprise are ultimately about how you integrate an LLM into an existing enterprise workflow rather than viewing the LLM as the sun and your process orbiting around it. We think it's going to be just the opposite. It's how do you start integrating privately and in a cost-effective way that LLM into an existing enterprise workflow. And then finally, in almost any type of RAG automation scenario that we've seen, there's still going to be a human in the loop review before any type of output from that LLM gets committed to a system of record. As long as that's a step in the process, you really have to look at the total cost total cost of ownership and the total productivity value of the automation from the LLM holistically. And that is, even if you wind up losing a point or two of accuracy, even if the SUV isn't as fast as the sports car, as long as it can get the job done with sufficient accuracy, any, any small differences um, in, in overall accuracy are going to be picked up in this human-in-the-loop process. And so that's why we really believe that when you look holistically, we believe that open source models in the 1 billion to 7 billion parameter range are much, much more practical, provided that they can deliver meaningfully accurate results um, in a RAG use case. So this brings us to the next question. Um, how do you actually evaluate the accuracy of it? Again, lots of claims get made. But some of the questions are, well, how do you actually measure that? Um, and how do you start to look at some of these smaller models to assess how fit for purpose they are in a particular RAG use case? What are some of the better small uh, RAG instruct tuned LLMs? Well, we spent a lot of time on Hugging Face and it's a place that um, we spent a lot of time you know, looking at different models, tracking the state of the art, looking at interesting research projects. What actually surprised us is we, we really couldn't find very good answers to either of these questions in terms of a, a clear benchmark test that was focused on closed context, enterprise specific retrieval augmented generation to evaluate the accuracy. And second, we actually found a, a surprisingly um, few number of LLM models in the 1 billion to 7 billion parameter range that had been fine tuned and optimized for these types of retrieval augmented generation areas. And then finally, what types of use cases? And what are some of the areas where it's, it's fine to use a smaller model? What are some of the use cases where it's not, where it creates risk or exposure? These are the three questions that we set out um, to answer. 
And so the first thing that we did is uh, we created a, uh, a benchmark tester data set. Uh, we released uh, this data set um, on Hugging Face. You can find it at the link below. And what it was designed to do, it's 200 questions, including all of the passage contexts. The domain is all from finance, from legal, from contracts, from invoices, financial news, uh, market uh, research, some technical um, and some general um, uh, news. And what we did is, is we actually built up a set of 200 questions, um, really consisting of two parts. First is 100 core test questions. We use those 100 questions to form an accuracy score for every single model. Um, I'm going to show you those questions in a second. The second thing we did then for questions 100 to 199 is we actually created five specialized skill categories so that we could start to evaluate the capabilities of models in some more specialized areas. Uh, one of those that's really important is not found classification, where we tried to trick the model. We passed it a question that couldn't be answered from the passage context to see how the model would respond to that. Second uh, is Boolean yes-no questions. Um, very important in a lot of classification activities, especially in conjunction with a threshold. Does it fit into this category? Does it fit into that category? Third is everyday math and logic, just some basic questions about increments, decrements, some basic multiplication, um, evaluating percentages and thresholds, ranking, sorting, and some basic logic. The fourth were a whole series of quick hit um, complex categories of Q&A that we wanted to look at, multiple choice capability, table reading, the ability to do complex multi-part extraction, looking across a long passage. Um, and then finally, the last 20 questions, which are summarizations. Each of those five categories we look at um, in a different context, and we evaluate them separately for each model. Now, what's a representative list of the questions that were in um, the, the first 100 questions? What you can see, these are actual real types of questions that we get from clients, especially in you know, financial services, um, procurement, legal, um, in all sorts of you know, financial markets types of contexts, real questions that people want to ask of business documents. Oftentimes it's scale. We have 10,000 invoices. We want to be able to extract what the payment terms were. Or we're looking through thousands of pages of financial statements and we want to be able to extract a piece of information like was the gross margin above a certain level or what was the information you know, that was predicted by economists or um, you know, what was Bank of America's rating on a particular stock? Very, very specific questions that we want to be able to ask of our documents. So we believe this is a very representative of the kinds of use cases that we see most people deploying RAG today. Second uh, key piece, um, the models. Uh, so we set out um, seeing that there was a, a relative gap of the smaller RAG and struct train models we sought out to build the best models between 1 billion and 3 billion parameters that could be run without a GPU. Uh, you can check out some of our other video series explaining the background for this and some of the objectives and goals. Uh, but what we did is we took 20 plus uh, smaller open source LLMs ranging from 100 million to 7 billion parameters. We looked at all the leading um, base models we brought them through multiple rounds of fine tuning. Um, we have a, a, a whole, whole variety of proprietary curated uh, data sets that we've built up. We tried multiple cuts at it, distilling it in different ways, optimizing it for particular models, along with um, all of the training hyperparameters. And then what we've done is we've launched this whole project of Bling um, on our Hugging Face page um, under LLMware. And eight of these models are currently in the Hugging Face uh, repository, um, all available um, with, with two lines of code um, to pull down and run uh, locally. Now, the results. So we combined step one with step two. We took our benchmark test, we applied it against um, the Bling models to try to evaluate the accuracy and how, how effective were these models at the types of questions that we were asking. Um, all of these results, and I'm going to show you this in a minute, all of these results are available in the model repo files uh, section um, on Hugging Face. So you can actually go, we generated two test uh, runs for each model. There were minor variations between the runs, and then we took the average um, of those results. All of that, again, is available um, in the files repository for those particular models. Uh, what you see um, are actually pretty good results. Um, you can actually read it from from bottom up. 
Starting with the 1 billion parameter model, um, it got 73 out of 100 questions right. The stable LM, the model that's 2.8 billion parameters, got 94 out of 100 right. And what you can see here pretty quickly is that models, even in the 1 billion to 3 billion range, are going to be in the 80s to 90% plus accuracy um, on the types of questions that we just looked at. Now, the next three categories are also pretty instructive because you see a very significant increase in this as you look at slightly larger models. The NF is the not found classification. That is the 20 questions that are in the benchmark test data set where we try to trick the model. What you can see is that the smaller models tend to be tricked more easily. S models get a little larger. They become more effective at recognizing that based on the question you've asked, the information is not contained in the passage that you've provided. Yes, no, and Boolean questions. Again, we were actually pleasantly surprised that um, you know, models like Sheard Llama, uh, the stable LM models were in the 60 to 80% range of getting yes, no, a Boolean questions correct. But all of the models, what you'll see, were quite poor at basic math and logic. When we looked at a 7 billion parameter model, we did start to see better results in terms of math and logic. But I think one clear takeaway, if, if you're gonna use models this size in RAG tasks, they can be quite effective at, at extractive Q&A, but they're gonna be pretty poor um, at actually at math and logic. As I mentioned, all these test results, you can actually look on Hugging Face. You can go to the model repository page, you look at the files, and you can actually pull up all the actual test results, the scoring sheet that we used for all the test runs for these models. It's useful as you're thinking about deploying any of these models to in effect get your own risk rating of what are some of the areas where these models struggled with in terms of specific questions, and what are the areas where they were very strong so you can evaluate the fit for your use case. Um, this is what one of the scoring sheets looks like. You can see it's a pretty simple JSON-L scoring list, has the LLM response um, along with the uh, gold answer, so you can quickly eyeball um, the, the uh, accuracy. Now, as I mentioned, we, we also looked as part of this at 7 billion parameter models. We haven't released this work. Um, we're still fully evaluating it, but we thought it was pretty instructive when you look at the performance of a 1 billion parameter model versus a 1.3 billion parameter model, it's really interesting to see a, a nine point increase um, in accuracy from a billion to a billion three, with significant increases then on the other three categories. You see a similar uh, big jump from 1.3 to 2.7 billion. We were actually, frankly, pretty surprised that uh, 2.7 billion parameter models were 92% accurate on answering those 100 questions and showed pretty good results on average across yes, no, not found recognition, um, but still quite poor um, in math and logic. The 7 billion parameter models that we've tested, and we've tested more than five, but the five best performing are all right around 94, 95% accurate, do continue to show an increase in not found recognition, um, yes, no, Boolean classification, then you can see a pretty big jump um, in math and logic accuracy, although even 7 billion parameter models, even when fine-tuned, still are not um, exactly uh, you know, math wizards. Now, key takeaways um, from this work. Um, the first, and I, th I think the big headline takeaway, is that we believe that accuracy levels of 80% plus with 1.3 billion parameter models, 90% with 2.7, and 95% with 7 billion, we actually think this is good, useful um, you know, levels of accuracy, especially when concentrated in extractive information tax tasks. To get the best results, um, we found keeping a slightly smaller context window, um, focus on fact-based um, Q&A and information extraction, avoid math, the other thing that we did in all the tests is that the temperature was set a little lower for these models. The temperature was set uh, at 0.3, um, lower than some typical guidance that people might use in larger models. Um, and finally, one thing that was really notable to us is it was largely absent of hallucinations. Again, we would encourage you, all the test results, all the model outputs are in those repositories. We'd encourage you to go through them. But generally speaking, we did not find any hallucination behavior where the model went off and created facts that did not exist. Now, our big takeaway um, is that we believe that, that the models are going to keep getting better. So if in 2023, you know, when we look back a couple of years from now, we actually think this is what our state-of-the-art open source SUV might look like. This is what we think it's probably going to look like over the next 12 to 24 months, which is really a no compromises 
uh, no, uh, no trade-off. You can have the best of both worlds of the SUV that's your workhorse that integrates um, into all of your enterprise workflows and automation, but it's gonna have the speed, the performance, and everything that you would expect of a sports car. Now, for more information, if you're interested in this project, um, we have a lot of active research going on in this area, so we would encourage you, check us out on Hugging Face um, at LLMware. You can go to our main GitHub repo, LLMware-AI. You can also, for more videos, check out um, our YouTube channel or see a series of blogs that we've written on this on Medium. Um, so with that, we hope that you've enjoyed today's session. Um, thank you for joining, and we look forward uh, to seeing you on future um, upcoming videos. Thanks again. Bye-bye.